if he had the Holy Spirit, he would do both. For when God the Spirit is come into a man, he teacheth him all things, and guideth him into the way of all truth. A man can do all things through Christ, strengthening him, but he can do nothing who is without God. Hath not the Lord himself said, Without me ye can do nothing? 1 Corinthians 2.14 John 14.16 John 15.5 John 16.3 Philippians 4.13 which was the richer man, the rich man who had everything but God, or the beggar who had nothing but God? To the rich man when on earth it would have seemed a foolishness to have said, The beggar with God. But now, if he could come back and speak to us after having felt for 1,800 years what it is to be without God, how do you think he would answer the question? Deeper than the human heart can fathom is the meaning of the words without God. Yet what it is to be without God is a lesson that either in this world as Lazarus did or in the next world as the rich man did. Every man must learn and come to understand for himself. He who learns it here may bless the Lord for it, for here no man need remain a moment without God. Invitation follows invitation, and a promise, promise, to all who are hungering and athirst for him. Indeed, it is hard to conceive of a more blessed state on earth than the state of that man or woman who is able to cry from the heart, My soul is athirst for God. But he who never thirsts for God here will thirst for him before he has been dead a minute. He who never longs for a Savior on earth will most surely feel his want of a Savior in hell. The rich man was contented without God in the world, but as soon as he was in hell, he realized his need, and his first cry was, I thirst. A frightful place is hell in which for the first time to learn the agony of thirst. It is described in the Bible as the pit where there is no water. Zechariah 9.11 Christ did not go to the angels who fell from their first estate, but to earth with his plan of mercy, and he brought back the God of mercy, not to devils, but to men. For Christ's sake, God will give his Holy Spirit to any man on earth who asks him, but Christ has not brought back God to devils. There is no Holy Spirit to allay man's cravings or satisfy his wants in hell. It is true God is in hell, for God is everywhere, but it is God out of Christ. God taking vengeance on those who live contented without him in this world. God, a consuming fire. Psalm 139, 8. He who would escape the rich man's fate must beware of the rich man's sin. Contentment without God. Chapter 4. The Poor Rich Man. Alas, for the poor rich man, how many things he does now that he never did on earth. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. The purple, the fine linen, the sumptuous affair are gone forever, and in their place there is torment, want, prayer, and the last mentioned, not the least point recorded for our learning. The eyes of the rich man have been opened, and he sees the kingdom of heaven. 
Oh, how terribly it must increase the agony of the people in hell to see the kingdom of heaven. The rich man lifts up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Until he was in hell, the rich man had never seen heaven, for he had lived and died without being born again. And, says the scripture, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. It is possible that while on earth he may have seen something of the kingdom of hell, I believe most men who live in a Christian country under certain dispensations of God's providence at some period or other of their lives get more or less vividly a view of the kingdom of hell. Sickness, the death of a friend or relative, a stirring sermon, a conversation with a faithful Christian, these and many other things may bring a man to think about eternity and ask himself the question, what is to become of me when I die? In such cases, conscience often gives the true answer, you will go to hell. The thought is horrible, more horrible at the moment than the mind can bear, and dear as are his sins, and great as will be the sacrifice, he determines to give them all up, and to live the rest of his days, so that when he dies, he may escape hell. In the moment of such convictions, he sees this much of truth, that it will profit a man nothing if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. But the heart of man was never yet changed from the love of sin to the love of God by a mere slavish fear of punishment, and unless it undergoes this change, man can never enter into the kingdom of heaven. I do not say despise the fear of hell. The devil never gave a man even a slavish fear of God. And if you have any thought at all about eternity, it is of God's mercy and may be to you the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Go to Christ with it and believe what he tells you in his word. If your fear brings you to him who has said, I will in no wise cast out, men may call it slavish or by what name they will, but it will be to you a blessed fear, a fear made instrumental by God to the saving of your soul. But for all this, such a view of eternity may be, and too often is, only a carnal fear passing away with the circumstances that gave it birth. A man may see the kingdom of hell in this world and forget it, but let a man, his eyes being opened by God's Spirit, once see the kingdom of heaven, and he will never forget it. It may be obscured from his view for a season, but if he once really sees it, he will never permanently lose sight of it. Eye hath not seen, that is the natural eye, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But to him who sees the kingdom of heaven, these things have been revealed by the Spirit of God, who in showing him the kingdom hath also shown him the king, given him a glimpse not only of the pleasures that are at God's right hand forevermore, but a discovery of God himself.
from that moment, the moment that a man on earth really sees God, nothing less than God can satisfy him. Henceforth he counts all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, his Lord. If at any time he does not, it is because for the time he has lost sight of God. For the man who sees the Lord always before him will not be moved. The rich man lived and died without God and never on earth saw the kingdom of heaven. But now in hell his eyes have been opened to see. In torments he lifts up his eyes and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Again I say how the sight, adding mental agony to bodily, must have increased the torments of the poor rich man. He now sees not only what must forever be his portion, but what forever that portion might have been. Not only the misery to which he has brought himself, but the glory past knowledge from which he has excluded himself. How literal and real are those things to him now which once seemed so dreamy and unsubstantial. God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the devil and his angels are now too convincingly proved to be real persons. Heaven and hell, real places. And oh, who can describe the agony with which he realizes to himself that while there once was a time when he might have sought and found God and been made meet to be a partaker of an inheritance with the saints, he is now not only doomed to spend eternity with the devil, but forever shut out from the kingdom of heaven. But not only does the rich man see what he never saw on earth, but his very first act in hell is to do what he never did on earth. No sooner was he in that place of torment than he began to pray. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. What a lesson have we here. May you to whom God now sends it profit by it. Do you obey the commandment in all things by prayer and supplication to make your requests known unto God? Do you feel your need as one born into the world without God of seeking and finding God? Are you really desirous to get your needs supplied? Does God know you are desirous? because he constantly hears you in your secret chamber begging and praying him to give you his Holy Spirit, which is only another way of saying, Give me thyself. Are you, in short, a man of prayer? Do you believe it has ever been witnessed of you in heaven as it was of Paul? Behold, he prayeth. If not, be quite sure that when you die, you will go where the rich man went, and that the first thing you will do when you get there will be to pray. Before the rich man was in hell five minutes, he began to pray. Our Savior records it as his first act. He lifted up his eyes and saw, and the moment he saw, he cried, saying, this will always be the case the moment a man for the first time sees the kingdom of heaven. Whether that first time be in heaven or in hell makes no difference. The moment a man sees the kingdom of heaven, he is certain to begin to pray. The reason is this. He sees a satisfying portion and his heart thirsts after it.
If this happens in this world, his prayer will be heard. And for Christ's sake, and by Christ, his hungering and thirsting will be satisfied. But if it occurs in hell, the prayer will be too late. For man's need can only be satisfied by Christ. And there is no Christ in hell. This cry for water was the first real prayer the rich man had ever uttered. He might have said his prayers, as people call it, night and morning when on earth, but now he was no longer merely saying prayers, but praying. The words of his lips were the genuine desires of his heart. He really and truly wanted that for which he professed to ask. Had he so prayed on earth, God would have given him rivers of living water. But he had not so prayed. Indeed, he could not, for on earth he felt no need of what he wanted in hell. It is possible, I say again, that he might regularly have said his prayers, but the rich man never prayed until he lifted up his eyes in torments. He had nothing to pray for till then. On earth he had everything except God, and on earth he felt no need of God. There can be no real prayer where there is no sense of need. Would that the vast distinction between saying prayers and praying was more pressed home upon congregations by their ministers and on the world generally by godly teachers and other Christians. How comparatively small compared with those who content themselves with what they term saying their prayers is the number of those who really pray. Many have said their prayers from their earliest childhood who have never prayed. Many have for years knelt night and morning at the family altar and joined Sabbath after Sabbath in professed worship who have never prayed. Many, both in public and in private, have put themselves daily from their youth upwards in the attitude of prayer and uttered from the mouth words of prayer whose so-called prayers have not only not been prayer but blasphemy. Saying prayers without praying is blasphemy. God has said, The Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Yet I believe that no greater breach of the third commandment ascends from earth into the ears of God than that which too often ascends from the closet and from family circles, excepting only that which ascends on the Sabbath day from the public assemblies of God's professing worshippers. Who can deny that multitudes of people who have been baptized into the name of Christ and who would, if you doubted their Christianity, think you yourself were no Christian, go up to their different churches on the Sabbath day for no other reason than that it is the custom. Go up expecting to be no better for going up and totally forgetful that if they are not the better, they must be the worse. Multitudes of such have forgotten and multitudes of such perhaps have never known that the scripture hath said if the word of God is not unto those who hear it a savor of life unto life, it is a savor of death unto death. Yet do not a vast proportion of professing worshippers go up without any realization that they are going up to hear for life 
or death, are they solemnized by the recollection, or indeed do many of them even recollect at all, that when they pray they are speaking to God, and God hears them, and that when they hear his word read or preached, God is speaking to them and expects them to attend and obey. Do they not rather go up utterly unsolemnized and enter God's house of prayer and put themselves in the attitude of prayer with a heart altogether prayerless? In a prayerless spirit, men go up to God's house of prayer. In a prayerless spirit, they put themselves in the attitude of prayer. And thus, in a prayerless spirit, invoke God's special attention. For the attitude of prayer is in itself a prayer. And says as plainly as words could speak it, O oh God, let thine eye rest upon me. And God's eye does rest on all who put themselves in the attitude of prayer from the moment he bows his head to say his prayers to the moment in which he leaves the place of worship. God's eye is never off the professing worshiper and his ear is open attending to what he says. And what does the eye of God too often see and his ear too often hear. He sees people professedly engaged in his worship, not only forgetful, but so absolutely destitute of the fear of God that they pour forth from their lips a series of supplications for things for which their hearts feel no need, for things for which they have no desire for things for which, though they profess to ask, they would rather be without, for things which God has offered them again and again, and which they have again and again rejected. Can there be greater blasphemy? Let me say a little more about this. If uttered, for instance, without desire and without a sense of need, what can more blasphemously break the third commandment than the prayers offered up by members of the Church of England when using our liturgy on the Lord's Day? And remember that although I have mentioned the prayers of the Church of England because I have there got the very letter of the words used that the prayers of all the evangelical churches are the same in substance, expressing the same wants and professing to seek the same blessings as the petitions used in the English service. That service begins by calling on the worshipers to fall upon their knees and confess their sins. Whether they kneel or not, they put themselves in the attitude of prayer, and thus having invoked his attention, they begin to speak to God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone what we should have done and done what we ought not to have done. There is no health in us. Have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them which confess their faults. Restore thou them which are penitent. This is part of the confession. Seeing what we see and knowing what we know, can we with the greatest stretch of charity believe that the generality of the worshippers feel the reality of what they utter, that they are miserable sinners, that they need to be spared, need to be restored, and are truly penitent. Whether they feel it or not, however, they go on to pray. 
grant, O most merciful Father, for Christ's sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Now I would ask any man who is willing to take one atom of thought about the matter, whether a person feeling neither sorrow for past sin nor intention for the future of trying to live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of God can commit a more frightful act of blasphemy than to call upon God to listen to Him while He utters the words of the this confession and prayer. Then follows the Lord's prayer. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These petitions are poured into the ears of God from every mouth in the congregation, yet how many prove by their everyday life that they desire God's name to be hallowed. How many would truly welcome him if, in answer to their prayer, Christ kingdom really was to come. How many would remain to live and reign with him if only those were left whose hearts as well as whose lips had prayed, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These things will all yet be. God's name will be hallowed. His kingdom will come and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But when they are, many who have professed to pray for them on earth will begin to pray to the rocks to cover them and the hills to hide them and in the end as the poor rich man did for a drop of water to cool their tongues. I might go on in this same strain through the whole service of the Church of England as also through the usual extempore petitions of all the evangelical congregations, but I will not press the subject further. I have said sufficient, I hope, to make my reader think. My desire is to get all to remember that when a person puts himself in the attitude of prayer, he immediately and by his own act and deed invites the special attention of God. His position is then a very solemn one, and surely he should be careful what he says, especially should he be careful not to mock God by professing to ask for what he knows he does not want, to utter a string of petitions in which the heart takes no interest is, I again repeat, blasphemy and not prayer. And they who are guilty of such a sin do the devil service while they provoke and dishonor God. Chapter 5 He Prays The prayer of the rich man, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, was no prayer of the kind I have spoken of in the last chapter. The rich man was in earnest. He felt in need of what he asked for, and he desired to get it. Oh, how earnestly he desired. Never in his lifetime had he so longed for anything. Perhaps as he lifted up his eyes, now no longer blinded by a veil of flesh, he saw the pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, that living water which Jesus gave to the woman of Samaria and to so many others when he was on the earth, that water of which if a man drank, he shall never thirst. I think he did. I think, too, that he saw, though that river could never flow down to hell, yet that 
through the Lamb, out of whose throne it issued, it had flowed down to earth. Nay, more, had not only flowed down to earth, but had actually been flowing past him all the time that he was on earth. He had never heeded it. Still, for all that, day after day, month after month, year after year, he now knew that this pure river of water of life had been within his reach. He remembers, too, that many a time a voice had called him, saying, Come ye to the waters. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the waters of life freely. At the time he had paid no attention to the call, the water was flowing by him, but he had purple and fine linen and sumptuous fare every day, and while surrounded by the rich viands of earthly luxury, what need had he of living water? Never did he believe that the day could come when, for a drop of that water, he would have given a million times over all that he ever had. But that day had come, and he believes it now. Yea, he knows it. And oh, how it increases his torment to remember that there was a time when he had only to stoop down and drink. Without money and without price he might have drunk abundantly of that water then, and if he had but drunk, he never would have died. The spirit of life was in the waters, and death temporal would have been the passage to life eternal. But the opportunity when he had it was lost, and he must now forever endure his agony in the pit where there is no water. Zechariah 9:11. Oh, my brother, if you have not done it before, drink now of this water. In other words, I beseech you, give yourself no rest until you have sought and found God. Again, I tell you, you have not God by nature, and I will add that you may have been baptized and a regular attendant for years at the Lord's table, and yet still be without God. Let there be no uncertainty about the matter with you, for he that has not God is unsaved. With what earnestness and authority did the Apostle Paul preach this doctrine and exhort the Corinthians to examine themselves whether they had God? Examine yourselves, he says, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Second Corinthians 13.5 now the meaning of this scripture is solemn, very plain, and easily understood. There can be no mistake about it. It places all the world in two divisions, and so cuts the ground from under the feet of every other. In it, the Holy Ghost tells us there are but two classes, those in whom Christ is and those who are reprobates. This is not the devil's teaching and is most offensive to his people. The devil desires to make at least one other class, those who have no reason to think they have Christ and yet think they have no reason to call themselves reprobates. And into this third and most unscriptural class, Satan has drawn multitudes. The great masses of professing Christendom are neither murderers, nor adulterers, nor drunkards, nor Sabbath breakers. They are not as a body outwardly profane or immoral. On the contrary, I believe that the greater portion of men are quietly laboring to get their own living and are doing their duty tolerably as between man and man in the position of life in which God has placed them. 
but yet multitudes of these men have not and know they have not Christ they would acknowledge it if you ask them but in the same voice they would deny that they were reprobates that is only fit like worthless dross for that is the meaning of the word to be cast out of God's sight forever and yet God says Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates who then is the teacher that says a man can come short of having Christ and not be reprobate it is Satan dear reader it is Satan and though a man may be as amiable as moral and as lovable as nature can make him if he has not God or as the apostle says if Christ is not in him he is in the devil's division and as reprobate silver is cast out by the refiner so if he dies as he is will God cast him out to my mind there is more likelihood of the conversion of publicans and prodigals than of a class which while it describes itself as not so good as it ought to be places its hope of finding mercy on not being so bad as it might be a class no member of which would dare to say he had got God yet would dare to say he was not bad enough to be cast into hell he therefore who is not prepared to deny that the Bible is the word of God must acknowledge that the statement Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates closes every door of hope against the man who has not got God he that hath not the son hath not life but the wrath of God abideth on him once more then I urge you examine yourself as to whether you have God eternity is before you sooner or later you know that you must enter on it and you may be called to enter on it at any moment if you can run the risk of such a call before you have a good scriptural reason to believe that you have sought and found God how great over you must be Satan's power contentment without God was the sin of the rich man he chose the world and the things of the world for his portion on earth and you can do exactly what the rich man did if you please but will it answer did it answer for him for that sin he has been for upwards of 1800 years lifting up his eyes in torments vainly praying for water to cool his tongue for that sin amidst a multitude of other agonies his irrevocable doom has become thirst thirst for that which God once offered him yea even besought him to accept but for which he must now in the midst of unceasing torments pray and forever pray in vain will you then as God's word has declared the rich man's a portion to be prepared for everyone who dies without Christ and reprobate refuse to examine yourself as to whether you have got God but perhaps you know without examination that you have not if this is so it is by God's mercy that you are reading what you are and you are exactly the sort of person into whose hands I wished my book to fall you have not got God you acknowledge that you have not and you are contented contented with the good things or in seeking after the good things of this life although you are without God who gives you the power to be thus contented without God think 
you know your contentment is not the peace of God, then whose contentment, whose peace must it be? Think. I say again, think. Is it not an awful power to possess, to be able to rest satisfied with the devil's contentment and contented without God? Will you, can you, if you know you are without God, continue thus contented? What is it that you are getting in exchange for God? Whatever it is, is no doubt pleasant enough now, but what can it do for you in the hour of your soul's need? That hour looks far off, perhaps, but it may come sooner than you expect. At all events, it is coming. Esau sold his birthright for one morsel of meat, and you think he was a madman, yet are you not guilty of far greater madness if you sell your soul for the pleasures of sin and take what the devil and the world can give you in exchange for God? I feel much pressed in spirit while writing on this part of my subject. May God the Holy Ghost for Jesus Christ sake bless it to all who read it but I was myself once contented without God my whole idea of happiness then consisted in spending my time agreeably it was a pleasant day to me on which amusement after amusement prevented it from hanging heavily on my hands but suddenly during the days of this contentment and in the midst of forgetfulness of God, I was taken ill, so ill that I thought I was going to die. I then learned something of what it was to be without God. Where was my contentment then? What could those things which up to that moment had been my joy and peace do for me then? What should I have cared for the whole world if it had been offered to me then? I had no want then but one, and that was God. Oh, how willingly then would I have suffered the loss of all things, and as the apostle says, have counted them but dung, if I could only have won Christ. My life itself would have been as nothing if by laying down my life I could have got God. I was without God and felt it, and everything was valueless except Him. For seven months I sought Him, but I could not find Him. Nature could not have stood much more, and my friends began to fear for my reason. But man's extremity is God's opportunity, and at last I had scriptural warrant for believing that though he never would have been found of me if I had not first been found of him, that for Christ's sake he had forgiven my sins, had given me his spirit, and that I had got God. Still, do believe me when I tell you that all I have ever known or imagined of agony never came up to the agony of the seven months in which I believed and felt myself to be without God. Conceive what are the sufferings of those who are without God and feel it forever and ever. Now what happened to me may happen to you. You may be taken ill, and what happened to me may not happen to you. You may be taken ill and not feel your want of God. Long before you die, you may have rejected God once too often, and he may have sworn in his wrath that you shall never enter into his rest. In that case, perhaps even your deathbed may be without 
terror. You may give directions about your funeral, take leave of your family with calmness, and then die quietly and in apparent peace. You may never feel your need of God until you are in hell. But should this be so, good would it have been for you if you had never been born. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? This is God's own question by the mouth of the prophet Isaiah. And the devouring fire and the everlasting burning must be the portion of all who die without God. To be without God is death. To be without God and feel it is a devouring fire and will be an everlasting burning unless it be quenched in the waters of life. This death man does not and cannot feel naturally simply because he is dead. He must be spiritually quickened before he can feel spiritual things. But sooner or later, every man will be spiritually quickened. This death, sooner or later, God has determined that every man shall feel. I believe that this is the death the rich man felt in hell when he cried for water. I believe it is the death our precious Savior felt when forsaken of his father. He cried, My God, my God. God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was without God in the world and felt it. I believe this is the death every awakened sinner feels when he cries for pardon and the Holy Spirit before he believes in Jesus. When he believes his thirst is quenched, he gets God. God is in him from that moment, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Let no man say he does not know whether or not he has got God. Any man may answer this question for himself who will only take the trouble to read his Bible with prayer for the teaching of the Holy Spirit. If he is not sufficiently anxious about the matter to read his Bible and pray for teaching, he may be perfectly sure that he has not got God. The Bible says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. If on self-examination you have reason to believe that your thoughts, desires, tastes, pursuits and habits have undergone a transformation so that your affections are now set on things above and not on things on the earth. You have scriptural warrant for considering yourself a new creature. If not, what warrant have you for believing? You have got God. The Bible says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Now I do not tell you that in order to examine whether you have got God, you are to examine whether or not you have any sinful lusts and affections, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life will remain and make themselves felt in the best of men until their warfare is accomplished and death swallowed up in victory. But do you fight against these lusts? Examine yourself, for on this depends the evidence whether or not you have got God. If you are not crucifying the flesh with its affections and lusts, what warrant have you for believing you have got God? The Bible says, We, that is Christians, thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. 
and that he died for all, that they which live should not live henceforth unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Second Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Now says St. Paul, this is the universal judgment of Christians, that they should not live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them. And it cannot require much self-examination to ascertain whether or not this is your judgment. Your life, your daily conduct is the answer both to yourself and others. You call yourself a Christian. If any doubted your Christianity, you would think he was uncharitable. But do you live unto yourself or unto him who you say died for you and rose again? If you are living simply for self, if your thoughts, words, and works have their primary reference not to Christ's glory, but to your own well-doing in the world, what warrant have you for believing that you have got God? To be brief, have you the Spirit of Christ? The Spirit of Christ led him when he was on the earth to trust in the Lord and go about doing good. Have you this Spirit, the Spirit of Christ? If you have not the Spirit of Christ, you most certainly have not got God. On the other hand, if the things natural to the old man have so passed from you that the affections and desires of your heart are more set on heavenly than on earthly things, if you are crucifying the flesh and habitually living not unto yourself but unto him who died for sinners, you are doing what no man ever did or ever could do by nature. Your frames, feelings, doubts, thoughts, fears may be what they may, but you may be sure, and you dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ if you are not sure, that he who hath wrought for you this self-same thing is God, who also hath given unto you the earnest of his Spirit. The tempers and dispositions of your mind are not what they were by nature. It is true that the flesh still lusteth against the spirit, but it is a grief to you, for you have become heavenly minded. Though with Paul you cry out, O oh, wretched man that I am, with Paul also you can say, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. With the mind I myself serve the law of God. Be of good cheer, dear brother, fight on and fear not. The spirit that is in you is God's spirit, witnessing with your spirit that you have got God. Chapter 6 God the only hearer of prayer. Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Such was the earnest heartfelt prayer of the poor rich man, but its heartfelt earnestness could avail him nothing. His prayer was too late. But there was another reason also, even if it had not been too late, why this prayer was put up by the rich man could never have been answered. Such a prayer would have availed him no more if offered up on earth than it did when offered up in hell. It was not only too late, but it was addressed to a person who had no power to answer prayer. The man was in want, and his need was a need that in this world God not only promiseth, but delighteth to supply. The scriptures abound with invitations to the poor and needy lacking water. To them the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and to them they who have accepted the invitation for themselves are commanded to say, Come. To them are addressed the words, 
Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. But the same God who without exception gives to every thirsty soul these most gracious invitations tells them also to whom they must come for water not to saints or angels or the spirits of just men made perfect, but to the Lord Jesus Christ, to him of whom, under the teaching of God's Spirit, the Samaritan woman asked water, to him who in the temple stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, to him who hath said, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The rich man went to Abraham and asked him for water, and had he asked him for it, when he was on the earth, Abraham would have been as unable to give it him as he was when he asked him for it in hell. This prayer addressed to Abraham is the only instance in scripture of prayer being made to a saint. And though it bore no fruit in heaven, it has, like many other of the productions of hell, borne much on earth. Prayers to saints have become common now, and the rich man has had many disciples. But as God has declared himself the only hearer and answerer of prayer, and made a way, even though Jesus Christ is the Son, by which sinners, even the chief, can go direct to him, judge how such prayers must grieve and insult God. When man sinned, and God in consequence left him, there was no way remaining open by which God and man could meet. Man's sin had separated, and apparently forever, between God and man. No created intelligence, either in heaven or hell, could imagine any way by which it could be possible for these two, God and man, to be brought together in peace. There seemed a great gulf between them. To all finite wisdom as impassable on earth as is now the great gulf that is fixed between hell and heaven. Had things remained as they became when man sinned, there could have been no place found for repentance. For even assuming that man had felt sorry for his sin and desirous of asking pardon. The sorrow and the desire could never have been made known to God, for man could not have got to God to tell him of his penitence. The way to God, or as it is typified in Scripture, the way into the holiest, was barred by man's sin, and however much he might have desired it, there was no way by which man could get to God. I believe it is in reference to this fact that the Holy Spirit uses the wonderful language of Isaiah 59:16, And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. To God belonged mercies and forgiveness, though we had rebelled against him, and he was not willing that any should perish. But how could a way be made by which man could present his prayer to God, and by which God could grant it when it was presented? God's own arm brought salvation unto man, rather than leave us without an intercessor, or rather than that there should be no place where God and man could meet.
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to take our nature upon him. God was manifest in the flesh, and as man endured the death which sin had entailed on man. Not merely the death of the body, but the death of the soul, for his soul was made an offering for sin. Not merely the death of the body, but the being forsaken of God. As God left Adam for sin, so he left Christ. But the moment Christ was without God, he felt it. And immediately, as I have said before, the cry burst from him, I thirst. I know we are told that Christ uttered this cry that the scriptures might be fulfilled, but does any one suppose that it had reference to the thirst of the body only? Ah, no. The great thirst of the Savior was his thirst after God. To be without God is the penalty of sin. But when we are without him, to feel it and to thirst for him is the work of the Holy Spirit. Never did the cry, I thirst, go up from earth to God. Or in other words, never did man on earth feel his want of God and cry for him without getting God. Christ went to the cross laden with sin. Sins, it is true, not his own, but his people's. Still by these sins, he who did no sin was made sin in God's sight. God saw sin on Christ, visited him with its penalty, and forsook him. The agonizing cry that burst from the lips of Jesus, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Reveals how in the very moment of his desertion, the sorrows of death compassed him about, the pains of hell gat hold upon him. The man Christ to Jesus was without God. He who had heretofore been with him always had left him. And as the heart panteth for the water brooks, so thirsteth his soul for the living God. He longed, as every man does who is without God and feels it, to follow after God until he found him and brought him back to him. And what did he do? Did he cry to Abraham to intercede for him, or to Moses, who so often interceded when on earth for Israel? Did he ask Daniel, a man greatly beloved, to go to God and entreat him to come back? No. If he had, Abraham, Moses, and Daniel would have known nothing of the prayer addressed to them. For the saints of God are neither omnipresent nor omniscient, and even had they, their Holy Spirit would have been grieved that a man should have addressed to them what he should only have addressed to God. But the man Christ Jesus in his hour of need prayed to neither advocate nor mediator. He was forsaken of God for the sin that God saw on him. And in the moment that he was forsaken, he felt it and was a thirst for God. But in the same moment of his need, from the head and hands and feet of Jesus began to flow blood. It was that blood without the shedding of which there could have been no remission. But it was that blood which the scriptures declare cleanseth from all sin. When God saw that blood, he saw no more sin on Christ, for that blood had made a full and sufficient sacrifice, satisfaction, and ablation. The sin on him was all gone, washed all away in his own blood. 
In the extremest hour of his need, the man Christ Jesus sought neither mediator nor advocate with God. Yet it is certain that he who was made sin for us and for sin forsaken of God sought and found a way to God and prevailed to bring God back to him. How did he do this? The Holy Spirit, by the mouth of Paul, answers the question, By his own blood. By his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. Hebrews 9, 12. Glory be to God on high, on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. In Christ we see how God the Father devised a plan which by the Spirit of God, God the Son worked out, by which a man laden with sin could get rid of sin, find a way into the presence of that very God who had left him on account of sin and prevail with him to return to him. When the blood of Christ was shed for sinners, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. And now, says the Holy Ghost in another place, Hebrews 10, 19 and 20, we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. When this way was opened, Christ work was completed on earth and when his work was completed his people were complete in him he had finished the work that his father had given him to do and as he cried it is finished he bowed his head and gave up the ghost he was laid in the tomb the third day he rose again and at the appointed time ascended up where he was before as the everlasting doors were lifted up, that the King of glory might come in, what were the first words addressed to Christ by God the Father? Sit thou at my right hand. Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. But also sit there at my right hand as the man of my right hand, the man that is my fellow, the son of man who is also the son of God, the advocate with the Father, the one mediator between God and man. Oh, how the heart of Paul burned with holy faith and joy as he contemplated his acceptance with God through the finished work and advocacy of this mediator. It is God that justifieth, he exclaims, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Christ is at the right hand of God. He has ascended up on high, leading captivity captive, and hath received gifts for men. Yea, even for the rebellious also, that the Lord their God may dwell among them. Psalm 68:18. He is at the right hand of God, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2:33. In virtue of his exaltation to the mediatorial throne, God the Son has received from God the Father the gift of God the Spirit, and this gift he has received for men, yea, even for the rebellious. He who is without God and feels it on earth can now go to the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ and get his need supplied. But the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ brought back God to man and made this way by which man could go to God at the cost of his own blood. Acts 20. 28. 
Think then after the cross and passion, the death and burial, the glorious resurrection and ascension, and the exaltation to the mediatorial throne purchased at such a price. How insulting it must be both to the Father and to the Son, and how grieving to God's Holy Spirit when men seek other mediators and pray to other advocates and intercessors. I am the way, the truth, and the life, says Jesus. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Some will say, however, we do not go to the Father through other advocates and mediators, but to the Son, asking such as James and Peter, or the beloved disciple, or the blessed Virgin Mother, to propitiate him in our favor. First, I would ask such, do you think that anything or anybody could make Christ more willing to receive and save you than he is? Has he not purchased the power with his own blood? And then I would tell you that Christ and his Father are one, and that the only way to the Father is the only way to the Son. A man can no more approach Christ except by the blood of Christ than he can approach his Father. It was for the joy set before him, says St. Paul, that Christ endured the cross and despised the shame. And part of the joy set before him was that as the one advocate between God and man, he might forever sit down at the right hand of God, able to save to the uttermost all who come to God by him. To deprive him of this joy was the one great object of Satan during all Christ's life on earth, and that he may hinder it yet, as far as he can, is his object still. Hence his introduction of other ways to God, or other advocates and other mediators. Again, then, I remind you that the rich man's prayer is the only instance in the scripture of prayer being made to a saint. Never forget where it had its origin. Prayers to saints had their origin with the devil and his angels, were first offered by a lost soul in his agony, and came up direct from hell. Chapter 7 Earnest, Heartfelt, Too Late Prayer But not only was the prayer of the rich man addressed to the wrong person, it was also too late. Addressed to Abraham or to any but God himself through Jesus Christ, it never could have availed anything. But there was a day when the way by which the man Christ Jesus went himself to God was open to the rich man. And had he in that day, by the blood of Christ, gone in the name of Christ and asked God, for mercy, God would have listened to his prayer. Had he felt his need on earth as he felt it in hell, and cried to God on earth as he cried to Abraham in hell, God would have given him Christ, and Christ would have given him God. Oh, what eager, longing, earnest, heartfelt prayers are the prayers that are offered up in hell. With what strong crying and tears, and in what soul agony are they uttered. How truly do the lips that pour them forth feel their need, and how anxious are they to get their prayers answered. Answered they can never be, however, the prayers and the the sense of need are both alike unavailing. They are too late.
terrible is the thought of praying a too late prayer, and blessed forever be our most merciful God, who has confined this terrible thing to hell. To this truth give all the scriptures witness, that while in hell there is no place for hope, on earth there is no place for despair. On earth or in hell, the need of the unsaved is the same, and that need God has typified in Scripture by a need of water. There can be no hope in hell, because there is no water in hell. Zechariah 9:11. But to every thirsting soul on earth, thus saith the Lord, When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. Isaiah 41, 17 and 18 when Jesus spake of living water as he taught in the temple, St. John tells us that he meant the Holy Spirit and God's promise in the Old Testament of water to the thirsty is the same as Christ promise under the gospel dispensation that his heavenly father will give his holy spirit to all who ask him in the moment that a man asks on earth his need is all supplied for god cannot deny himself and he who really asks receives and he who receives the Holy Spirit receives a Father Son and Holy Ghost his body becomes the temple of the living God he is born of the Spirit he has got God all this is necessary for salvation and all this can be done for a sinner on earth but in hell there is no such thing as this. Dear reader, whoever you are, if you have not yet repented, believed the gospel, and received the Holy Ghost, I beseech you on the one hand not to despair, and on the other not to trifle with God. Now is your accepted time. Now is your day of salvation. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I now offer you water, water that Christ called living water, water in receiving which you receive God, for the gift of this water is the gift of God, water that shall be in you, a well of water springing up unto eternal life, and of which, if you drink, you shall live forever, water flowing forth from the rock that was smitten, and that rock was Christ. What say you? Will you accept this water now? Remember your need is the very same as the rich man's. If anybody could offer him water, what do you think could keep him from it? Then what keeps you? This. He feels his need, and you do not. Once he was like you, once the warning to prepare to meet his God and flee from the wrath to come fell as idly on his ear as perhaps it does now on yours. But this was because he knew not God and neither understood nor believed in his revealed word. But now when he cries for water to cool his tongue, he understands and believes both in God and his word. And oh, how closely would he follow any deliverer that could give him water. But there is no deliverer in hell. He cries and cries and cries, and yet there is none. 
and he must cry and will continue to cry through the ages of eternity and through the ages of eternity there will be no deliverer these thoughts are too frightful to dwell upon yet are they truths clearly taught us in the word of God and now clearly felt and known to be truths by the wretched rich man reflect upon them I beseech you and pause before you refuse water now again I tell you your need is the very same as his with this single difference you are on earth and he is in hell he must remain in need forever you can get yours supplied oh you whoever you are if you are still unsaved may God bless what I am writing to your salvation were it not that God's strength is made perfect in man's weakness who could even attempt to save his fellow for never does a Christian feel more impotent than when either by speaking or writing he is trying to make spiritual things touch and tell all on unconverted men but shall God's people therefore cease to try God forbid the promise is cast thy bread upon the waters the promise thou shalt find it if nothing less will do I pray God that not only every unconverted man who reads this book but every unsaved person on earth may feel his want and need as the rich man feels his in hell I pray to God that the souls of death may even now compass him that the pains of hell may immediately get hold upon him does this wish scandalize you? Do you call it uncharitable, unscriptural, unchristian? If so, suspend your judgment and let us consider together for a little the beginning of the 116th Psalm. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications because he hath inclined his ear unto me therefore will I call upon him as long as I live the sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell gat hold upon me I found a trouble and sorrow then called I upon the name of the Lord O Lord I beseech thee deliver my soul now in these verses we have a short but perfectly true history. They describe a case that really happened. They relate the experience of a man who is able to preface what he says by telling us that he loves the Lord. I love the Lord, he says, and he tells us why. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications because he hath inclined his ear unto me therefore will I call upon him as long as I live the writer of this had evidently been in some sore distress and his distress had sent him with prayers and supplications to God it is evident too that God had heard and answered his prayers and that in consequence his heart so lately filled with anguish was now filled with gratitude and love but what was the heart agony that drove him to prayer what was it that sent him with strong cryings and tears to God it was he himself tells us the very same sorrows and pains that drove the rich man to cry for water the sorrows of death compassed me about the pains of hell got hold upon me I found a trouble and sorrow then called I on the name of the Lord 
Now he who tells us all this was David, a man spoken of both in the Old and in New Testament, as a man after God's own heart. The Lord dearly loved David. If he had not, David would never have been able to say, I love the Lord. We love him, says St. John, because he first loved us. So that if any man loves the Lord, he may be sure that the Lord loves him. But how did the Lord show his love to David? By leaving him in the undisturbed enjoyment of purple and fine linen and sumptuous affair every day? No. But by doing what I said just now I wished he would do to every unsaved man on earth. By allowing the sorrows of death and the pains of hell to get hold of him. By sending him trouble and sorrow. It was a sore dispensation that came upon David. We learn something of its terribleness from an expression in the 88th Psalm. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. But was this terrible distractedness really hurtful or a proof of want of love on the part of God to David? No more, dear reader, than my wish is unscriptural and unchristian that you, if unsaved, may at once feel the want of the rich man. So far from want of love, this dealing of God with David was the greatest mercy that he could show him. It was the dealing of a wise father with the child he loved, a dealing that in its consequences brought back that child to God. Then, says David, then, when the sorrows of death compassed me about, and the pains of hell got hold upon me, then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Terrible as they were in their experience, yet these sorrows of death and pains of hell were amongst the greatest blessings that ever God gave to David. Under a dispensation that the heart loveth, a time of ease and idleness, David had sinned against God. But now when the dispensation is not joyous, but grievous, David remembers again the God against whom he had sinned, and goes back to him to save the soul his own wickedness had so well nigh destroyed. It was good for me, says David, that I was afflicted. Suppose David had never been afflicted. Suppose in this life his time of ease and idleness had never been interrupted. Suppose that, like the rich man, David had lived and died without a thought of death or hell, until the sorrows of a never-dying death and the pains of a never-ending hell had compassed him about. I say, suppose this. Had it been, do you think David would be thanking and blessing God for it now? By the mercy of God, it was not so. But do you think David wishes that it had been? Do you think that now, as amidst the multitude who came out of great tribulation, he stands and tunes his harp to praise, that David praises and glorifies with less loving adoration, because when he was on earth, God visited him with the sorrows of death and pains of hell? sorrows and pains that sent him to his knees with the prayer O Lord I beseech thee deliver my soul 
No, my dear brother, no, and neither will you by and by. You will one day acknowledge whether you acknowledge it in heaven, earth, or hell, that it is better to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Even on earth, God's people are the happiest. They have bread to eat that the world knows not of. Never did David feel such pleasure in his life as he felt when he could say, I love the Lord. The most pitiable object on earth is not the man whom the sorrows of death and pains of hell, or in other words, the agonies of an awakened conscience, are leading to seek God, but an unsaved soul at peace. And God's greatest curse out of hell is to allow an unsaved soul to be at peace. If this curse is on you, I beseech you, ask God to remove it. Unless it is removed, you cannot be saved. For unless it is removed, you will remain contented without God. Consider which is best, to ask God now to send you the pain and trouble which shall send you to him with David's petition, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul, or to wait for the pain and trouble which must sooner or later come upon you, and that will drive you to Abraham with the rich man's too late prayer. Send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue.